Hello, hello, everybody. It is 2.16 p.m. Central Time on the 24th of November, 2020. It's Tuesday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. We are here to talk about seismic events. And for those of you who are new here, let me just quickly explain. We're using Earthquake 3D, the program. I don't get anything for recommending it. And we're using the EMSC coming out of Europe and the USGS coming out of the United States to show us a good broad swath of earthquake activity. And we're looking at 48 hours worth of events. Finally, before we get going, the deep earthquakes, the deeper they are down into the planet, the higher they are off the globe. As you can see, we have three distinct sets of deep earthquakes going from Indonesia in the West Pacific across Fiji and spreading across the Southeast Pacific over onto the shores of South America. And that's down below Argentina, right at the central point of Argentina. Now these are again hundreds of kilometers down below in the magma, down below the plates in many cases, an area called the asthenosphere which is just a complex term to describe the magma down below the plate. So, down below the plates, we have disturbing force that comes up through the plate and next to the disturbing force from down below, coming up and spreading out from, that's where we expect shallower, larger earthquakes to take place. And we're going to start here. I'm going to zoom in on the location. You'll see this capital letter D and the capital letter D stands for Deep Earthquakes, creatively enough. We also have two letter Ds over here, one up in Japan and over in Afghanistan. We'll jump across the Pacific and check it out. We have a letter D right here at the Argentina-Chile border region. Now I'm going to turn the earthquakes back on, and what you're going to see are a series of deep earthquakes right at these letter Ds. It's a forecast point, a spot where we watch new deep earthquakes to take place. Like I said, a spreading activity, spreading up, out, and away takes place, I think at least. Let me show you what I think is happening with these deep quakes. I think concentric waves are coming in from down below the plates in the magma, and they focus in on each other in what's called a singularity or a spike. Now imagine that hammering in on the underside of the plate, but on a planetary-wide level across a whole region of the West Pacific, for instance, or down below South America. Now, when that hammering action begins, then going out from it, I believe, and I should say I think we have observed it at this point, the spread of earthquake activity takes place like a standing wave in a tank of water, in this case, in a laboratory, but the same thing is happening going through the plate boundaries themselves, which I'll show to you in a moment. But first, these standing waves form when you combine the waves. Instead of them becoming chaotic and jostling around in the tank, they combine and become uniform and grow in size or power behind them. The amplitude increases. They become taller or more powerful waves. Now notice how each wave's peak fills in the previous valley of the open area between the other waves. So as it moves through the tank, the middle point tends to get hit right on the spot where the next wave comes in, in the standing wave. Now that appears to be happening across the distances of the plate boundaries. And these plate boundaries you can see marked on the USGS map here, for instance. We have deep earthquakes coming up from right below here, Fiji, Tonga. We have deep earthquakes coming up right below over here right below Argentina, Chile border region. So on two sides of the Pacific, hammering action coming up underneath, then spreading out from those points. We have similar sized earthquakes. So let me show you. A 5.3 has struck right here. And over to the west, we have a 5.5 to 5.6. So those two similar sized earthquakes within a hair of a point of one another are then separated by a 4.5 and a 4.6. Again, two similar sized earthquakes, the 4.5 and 4.6. So all four earthquakes spreading out from that middle point, look where it took place. Look at this. Obviously right here we have the plate. Sorry, I just had to cough, by the way. <laughs> I had to mute it for a second. But going down towards New Zealand and over to the west, that's where our earthquake activity is taking place. 
spreading out from where this hammering action is coming in from the underside. Now we jump all the way over to Indonesia and we have another deep four and spreading up across all of Philippines. Look, a 5.4 again, almost the exact same size. And going between the two up to Japan, we have a 5.0 and a 5.5 again. So again, it's two of the same sized earthquakes, a 5.3 and a 5.5. And up here we have a 5.4 and a 5.5 with a five in between. And by the way, that five in between the two, between this 5.4 and this 5.5 marked in a pinkish color, that middle point is what we call a fulcrum point. And I can show you the fulcrum over here a little bit better. So we have a 5.5 up here in Japan, right next to Tokyo on the north side of this H-shaped bend from a day and a half, two days ago. And then we have our other 5.4 down here, and the new 5 has broken right in the middle in between the two, and we call that middle sorted point a fulcrum point that sorted itself out very quickly in the course of a day. So that middle point is where the rings overlap, by the way, where the pink rings overlap and the new whitish colored earthquake this morning struck. Now we usually see equal sized movement strike over on the western side over by Taiwan and into Okinawa. Now we just need to go back a couple days and look at that, a 4.9. Oh wait, where's the 4.9? It was already six days ago. Okay, there was a 4.9 six days ago. I would expect a new 5.0 range or a greater earthquake to strike here at the middle point on the western side. So if we get a five here on the eastern side, where the red line is, we expect a new five on the western side, almost similar spaced and around the same time frame. So we would think in the next couple of days, that middle point will be filled in with a new five or greater over by Taiwan and South Japan, North Philippines. Okay, now let's go over and look into Indonesia and just quickly take a look at the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center. We have to go see what volcanoes are erupting. Fuego in Guatemala, Kluchevskoy in Russia, Reventador in Ecuador, Sanjay in Ecuador, so Ecuador is going a little bit. Dukono in Indonesia, ongoing low-level ash emissions down in a steam plume that keeps going from White Island in the middle of the Bay of Plenty at New Zealand. Suwanizajima in South Japan, Fuego again, Kluchevskoy again, White Island again, and it's just a repeat of the list, Sabankaya in South Peru. Ibeko or Ebeko in the Kuril Islands, a 10,000 foot high blast. I'll show you where that is. That matters, actually. That one matters. And I'll tell you why it matters in just a moment. Oh, look, Nevado del Ruiz. Volcanic ash dissipated, but that's in Colombia. Okay, I'm glad I'm checking. Uh, anybody else on the list? Okay, that gets us back about two days. Okay, let me show you where these are. First of all, we're going to skip over all of Sumatra and Java, Indonesia. No eruptions which is abnormal. Normally there's a few. And there was one this past week, 20,000 something foot high, going up here at Mount Sinabung, I believe is where it was. But none in the past few days. So it's all quiet, no earthquakes or eruptions. That's not good. We would expect seismic release now in the middle, right here at the middle point by Mount Krakatau. Don't rule out a new eruption in the middle of point as well, but I would say watch that middle point for a significant seismic release in the next day or two. 48 hours. Going up here, we have one eruption at Mount Dugono today. One. Nothing back over to the east. Complete radio silence volcanically. Going up here to the north, we're pretty much quiet, except for Suwanizajima, which is in South Japan. Now we jump over all of North Japan, and we get right here. See where the rings overlap? Mount Ebeko is right here. And Kluchevskoy is right here on the Kamchatka Peninsula. So we have two side-by-side -side eruptions going on, basically at that middle open area in between both sets of quakes, and new seismic activity spreading up and around the area. So going from Japan up to Kamchatka, that's where we're focused right now, with one, two, three eruptions there at three different volcanoes. And then we get all the way back down here, and we basically just have one. So we are lopsided, and it's low in the volcanic area, it's low. We normally see a lot going on over there, so I would think we're getting ready to flare up with all these new deep earthquakes taking place. The lack of eruptions, the lack of large earthquake activity means something's coming imminently in the next two days that would be significantly larger than what we've currently seen. And by the way, the deep earthquakes, I want you to think of them when they happen in conjunction with one another, when there's more than one, 
we go back to that wave tank, and this is like the moving of the sides of the tank at either end, putting more pressure or power into the waves, compressing slightly, that these walls here can push in and out, and as these walls push, either this side or this side, that that's how you put more power into it, into the fluid in this case, and the water. But then when we're talking about the plate boundaries here, let's get back to the plate boundary map, that when we're pumping energy into this, and it's coming up from down below, and it's spreading out, we have to watch as you pump more energy into it for the waves to increase in height, or in this case, in amplitude or power, and meaning bigger earthquake activity at the middle. So the middle point here, for instance, here at Solomon Islands should break. The middle point here at Mount Krakatau should break, and these should happen in the next 48 hours. Oh, the middle point here between the earthquakes down in Philippines and the earthquakes up here in Japan, parallel over to our other fives, that should break. And it should all happen in the next couple days. Oh, same thing for down in New Zealand, by the way. Down in New Zealand, guess what that middle point is here? So we get in, we have your plate boundary right in the middle from Kaikoura all the way up into South New Zealand at Wellington. And keep in mind, the volcano here keeps doing something right in the middle of the catcher's mitt at the Bay of Plenty. That's the only other eruption going on across the Pacific in the Southwest Pacific. Now look at the pink colored earthquakes. Those are all over the past couple days. Do you notice anything about them? 4.4, or let's start, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5. Now that remember that because going over to the West, we have another 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. Three separate earthquakes, three separate sizes of earthquakes, but all within a point of one another. So all of North India going across and look, you can check Nepal off the list. We warned North India into n Southwest China, North Nepal, right here at the middle. And the middle has been filled in. But in the past 48 hours now, but in the last day, this is all that struck. That was yesterday, that 4.4. Let's wait for this to refresh. So this was yesterday. Today, I mean, I'm not seeing much. It's pretty quiet across Asia right now. But let's look at our earthquakes over the last 48 hours, and you can see there's an open point here in western China, Taklamakan Desert, going right up to the tip of the arrow over in northeast Afghanistan. I would look for a new break to take place, a new earthquake to take place, in between these two sets of 4.5s. It would be something bigger than both sets of 4.5s combined, which basically puts us into 5.0 range. So we would expect this new middle point here to be filled in by a 5 or greater. Now going over to the west, we get into Iran. And look back where all these earthquakes are here at the Caspian Sea. That's the body of water to the north. And our 4.4 from a day and a half ago down to the south on the plate boundary. And again, where the rings overlap, we're right at the Pakistan-Afghanistan-Iran border. And I would look also for something in the upper 4 to low 5 range. Something bigger than what's on both sides. And currently we have 4.5s basically on both, both sides. Well, hold on. A 4.4 and a 4.5. But we would look for something bigger, which puts us to the upper 4, lower 5 level. Over to the west, it's a big spread of small earthquakes, but they're all about the same size. Going from Turkey up into Bulgaria, Romania. Going across South Italy, Sicily, Central Italy, Switzerland. Going over to the west, we go across Spain and Portugal, South France, and Gibraltar. And this is all in the last day. So how much energy do you think it would take to displace everything from Turkey over to Portugal in a day's time on a 2.0 basis? A lot. It would take a lot of energy to displace the plate in that far of a distance on that level, even with it's just being twos. Another way to look at this is Bulgaria, Romania, over to the west, over into North Italy, Switzerland, back down across Sicily, down across North Africa, across South France, Spain, Portugal. All of South Europe, 2.0 basis, last day. Not even, the last 50 earthquakes it shows. 5.0, last 50 earthquakes, which is less than a day. So some exerting force or power is saturating all of South Europe right now. And it, Oh, by the way, it's reaching out all the way to where the dead end is here, out at the plate boundary, which you can see here going out to the Azores. And it's 3.0 range out there at the Azores, 3.8. Canary Islands still continue to move south of La Palma and now over east of La Palma. The whole area has moved and right in the middle here. La Gomera is where the cliff collapse happened this past week. So what's pushing it? Well, last week, or well, two weeks ago, 
there was a 7.0 range earthquake and tsunami that happened right here in the middle of the Aegean Sea over right next to Turkey on the Isle, uh, Greek island, but right next to Turkey's border. And then a spread of 4 and near 5.0 activity spread across South Europe going up to Switzerland. A 4 struck in Switzerland. A 4 struck over in Romania. A 5 point something struck down here at Albania. And a 4 point something struck up here at Croatia. Then a 5.2 struck over here at North Algeria. And North Algeria's, well, let me show it to you here, the red line. So energy finally flowed out across North Algeria as opposed to brute force going around the outside edge of Europe and striking up here at Romania and Poland. Oh, oh yes, Poland also got struck by a 4.3. But nothing progressed out past Poland. So the English Channel, UK, Norway, Iceland, North Pole, all has been cut off. And we can see that with the earthquake activity. Next to nothing up here to the north coming from Europe. We'll get into the 4.9 over here in Nunavut over at the tip of our arrow over in Canada. But So the spread is going across Europe. I'm going to look in between our sets of earthquakes. So how do we determine what our, our spreads of earthquakes are? Well, we have Southeast Europe and Western Europe which means that middle point between the two. We already know there's a 5.2 there down on the African plate boundary. I would think we would be looking here in South Italy, but it won't be as big as what's in Africa. It should be in the 4 range. So let's just put it at 4.1, 4.2, enough to get your attention, I think. But I hope I got that right. So there's still energy going across Europe. Now, there, it's all coming from over to the east, where I think we're getting ready to have another noteworthy-sized earthquake but this time, I think it's going to be just down next to Crete. So previously, we had warned Crete to Cyprus. Now we're going to warn just Crete itself. Let me show Crete on the plate boundary map. This might make a little more sense. Where the letter W bend here is, there's the Isle of Crete. And previously, we had warned here. Well, when we warned here, and instead there got it, I would say if we're warning here, we really have to warn everybody from Western Greece all the way down to Crete. And I don't know how many miles that is. Let's see. 100 miles, 200 miles, about 400 miles of the Greek coastline, I would warrant. And the size should be, I think, under 6, but above 5.5. How am I coming to that determination? That's just the size of the rest that's going around the rest of the planet, guys. 5.4 here, 5.5 here. We are On the other side of the plate, we have activity, which I'll show you in a moment. But it's all about the same size. So we think that that's probably going to be coming over to Europe as well. And that, well, Mediterranean. Once that hits, I'll issue new warnings for Romania, Poland, UK, etc. Aussies! Nothing. I guess you can just keep doing what you're doing. Everything seems to be going just fine. We had a series of small earthquakes down here spread across the center of the plate. Down next to Perth. Down next to Adelaide or Kangaroo Island. But we never saw a noteworthy earthquake 2 to 3.0 range. Did not see that up in northeast Queen Queensland. We were right at the border with Queensland. So I don't know if that's a hit or a miss on Queensland, but the rest moved. I mean, that's all we were expecting. Oh, oh, Uluru. Uluru did not move. So I don't know if you want to call that a, a strikeout. It's a strike and a half, a strike and a ball, <laughs> if you know baseball. Okay, South America. Deep earthquake right next to our letter D. I already explained that. Hammering action coming up from down below. One more time. The concentric waves coming in from the underside of the plate. Hammering in. Imagine this. 500 miles, just a random number. 500 miles worth of magma down below with a very low frequency wave. Vibrating through it. Magnetically charged maybe. Electric, electromagnetically charged. From plasmas down in the core of the earth which are fed by the sun, by the way. But looking at this, again, you can see it. It focuses in on itself, and the combined force of all the wave goes into a central point and up and out of the fluid. And that really matters with this hammering action, because you can imagine with a multi-hundred-mile-wide wave, if you will, that focuses in on a point on the underside of the plate, well, the energy doesn't just stop there where it hammers in. It comes up through the plate, and we get that larger movement next to our deep earthquakes. So this means we have to watch, now that a new deep earthquake has happened here, we have to watch in between our current sets of earthquakes for a shallower, larger earthquake, greater 
than 4.9. This is down at 566 kilometers deep. That means we watch for one magnitude larger earthquake up to maybe even bigger, but that would put us up to 5.9, 6.0 range again. And the spot that should get hit should be our central point between our current sets of earthquakes. I already have a warning partially fulfilled. One point of the warning has already happened. The six point whatever already hit when the impact happened into South America. I would imagine it to go down to the south in between our two sets of earthquakes here as the force flow tries to go down and around to the South Sandwich Islands. We also have to warn the South Sandwich now that we have a new deep earthquake. Let me take you back in time. Let me take you back in time a couple days. This. This earthquake struck near 5.0, striking on our fracture zones coming across. You see our two arrows. But if you look close, you should be able to see the undersea fracture zones that come into South America and go down to the south like a stair step. And when this earthquake struck, this 4.8, I issued the warning at the tip of the arrow for an impact to happen, that this is like a train coming across a bridge, and at the end of the bridge we have a mountain which it's going to hit. First thing that will happen, of course, the impact, like a wave crashing against the shores of uh, rocky shores, the full force of the wave crashing on the shore. And that just happened, a 6.1 earthquake at the tip of the arrow. First the 4.8, letting us know something's coming across, then the impact into the South American plate, then underneath the plate. As force is trying to go down around and underneath the plate. And look, we have this that says travels underneath. That's what's happening right now. Force is trying to go down around and underneath Argentina. So it stands to reason, I hope I got this right, that we would look between our sets of quakes to the south. Now what about the north? Up to the north, we have a big open silent zone between our sets of earthquakes. This is across Peru, 48 hours worth of earthquakes. We have nothing in here except for eruptions. Nevados del Ruiz, right here in Colombia. Reventador and Sanjay, both erupting in Ecuador. And Sabancaya, erupting down here in Peru. That's four eruptions from one, two, three, four, across the open area where there's no earthquake activity reported. So I would look in between our sets of eruptions if we take all these eruptions, Nevado del Ruiz, Reventador, Sanjay, and Sabancaya, and add them together. Each eruption is equal to about a 5.0 earthquake. Just in my estimation, I've said this for years, that each eruption equals a noteworthy sized earthquake because of the thousands of small tremors that happen when the release of magmatic contents or ash or, or gases, that that again is equal to seismic activity. And it adds up. And then we see the middle point between the volcanoes get hit with the combined total of the full release that happens seismically. So four eruptions, four 5.0 range earthquake equivalent. We add them together equals 5.4. Pretty simple. Every five you add on takes it up by a hair of a point. Add on another five, it would go up to 5.5. Add up on another five, it goes up to 5.6. So if there's four eruptions, that equals 5.4. And we would look right in the middle of Peru or close to the middle point between our sets of volcanoes, which I guess would be, I guess, north central Peru, where the arrow is or about there, for a new 5.4. So both sides are going to get hit, but it looks like the bigger earthquake, if I got this right, should go down to the south and travel down around to the South Sandwich Islands, where another large, similar-sized earthquake should take place about the same size, 5.9, 6.0, maybe bigger. I mean, I'm trying to err on the side of caution here. So across Central America, look what we have. The same-sized earthquakes that we were talking about over here, 4.5 and 4.6, and 5 and 5.4, correct? Well, look what we have here. 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, and a 5 right in the middle of the whole bunch, plus some eruptive activity. Remember what I said about that equaling 5 as well, because Popocatépetl erupting here across Mexico. We have Fuego, Santa Guido, and I don't know the third volcano there was that, Pacaya. Oh, man, I don't, I'm going on memory. But two of them erupting, and if you add those in, equals about a 5.3. But the spread, look at the earthquakes, look what they look where they are. Do you see how they're all on the western coast, pretty much, of Central America? A few of them going interior to Central America, like two of them, but the rest are right along the coast. Let me show you on the plate boundary map once again from the USGS. Here, they're all along the coast of Central America, which is the plate boundary, with just a few of them happening interior to the plate. And look where they're happening, interior to the plate, of course. They're happening on both sides of this, which is another red line, that's another plate boundary to the Caribbean plate. Goes over to the east. And 
pretty much equally spaced, or almost equally spaced. On both sides, we have about the same sized activity. Here we have a 4.5, and here we have a 4.9, or a 5. In between the two, where the two red lines come together, we have a volcano called Fuego Volcano that's erupting, and Santa Guido that erupted this past week. But Fuego's going right now, right where the two red lines come together. So Fuego's alive, activity on both sides, energy should be going out over to the east. And it will, we will see a new earthquake strike over here to the east that's about the combined total of what's just taken place here in Central America. So all those eruptions and that five and all these fours add up. And it's going to go over this way, following the line to the east. Now it's going to sort out just like everywhere else on the planet should go between our current sets of earthquakes. Let's turn down the rings to find out where they're really happening. I'll get into Jamaica in a second because, again, I got a first-hand report of a five-point-something earthquake striking in Jamaica last week from a person that lives there. But that middle point between our two sets of quakes, look where it puts us. It puts us right here, right on the coast of Puerto Rico. So, Puerto Rico, you're already swarming. Looks like you're going to go back up into the 5.0 range in the next few days. So let everybody know right now in Puerto Rico... When you start seeing activity over here across Central America like this, and you see eruptions taking place at Fuego across, across Guatemala, you have to look, treat this like a road, and this is the way your seismic flow comes in, for the most part. So if you see activity over here, treat it like a storm dropping water on a river, and you live downstream. And that's happening right now. Okay? Terremoto. 5.0 plus Puerto Rico. Next few days. When I say few, I should say the next five days. So that will put us into Sunday. 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. By the 29th, if nothing hits, I will cancel the warning. But it's already on the way. I mean, you can see it. There's all. This is the current earthquake activity. So this has already been deposited on the red line. And the red line comes over towards you. So the check's in the mail. It's just a matter of, is anything more going to be put in? Now let's get into the United States, Alaska, Canada, North America, the North Pacific. So we've already talked about recapping really quick. Deep earthquakes hammering on the underside of the plate. Shallower, larger earthquakes going up to 5.5 all the way around the plate, pretty much the same size. Equally spaced, pretty much equally spaced like the waves in the tank, spreading out to here where we have new eruptions that have started to take place at Kamchatka. That was at Kluchevskoy and Ebiko where the rings overlap. Going from there over into Alaska, same thing, 4.5, 4.0, going over up into Alaska. Then it takes a step down. The only thing missing from this middle point here is a new 5.0 range earthquake. All the other parts of the plate have the 4.5s going up and around, and then 5.5s and 5s mixed in between where all the 4.5s are taking place. Well, hold on. We got a 4.5 there, and let me... Get all the others out of there. Jeez, there's so many. The other 4.5 over to the east, right? Okay, pretty obvious. It's going all the way around the plate. So that middle point should get filled in with a new 5-ish earthquake here pretty soon. <laughs> in the next day or two, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It shouldn't matter to anybody, but it's just the middle point being filled in with the same size. Could go up into the 5.5 range. Once we get over to mainland Alaska, though, it matters to people. Right? So it doesn't matter when it's out in the middle of the ocean next to an island that nobody lives on. But once you get in here, look where the rings overlap. Let me turn them all down so you can see a little bit better. Right in the middle where the two sets of bigger rings overlap, that goes right into here where we have a whole cluster of earthquakes going into Anchorage. But you'll see there's a progression of smaller earthquakes going beyond Anchorage, up to Mount Denali, then spreading out across the northern slopes, going up here, focusing in on the northeast slopes of Alaska. A few smaller, same-sized earthquakes going over to the volcanic features over on the western side, over by the Bering Strait, the Selawik Hills. I don't know the name of the other volcanic field there off the top of my head. Let's go find it. See if we can remember that name. I know Selawik Hills is marked in blue here. Im Imaruk Lake. Imaruk Lake. And that's these are smart, uh, Smithsonian marked. So there they are. Lava flow and all that good stuff up there. Okay, so, recapping. The line of earthquakes coming into Alaska. Once it comes into Alaska, it goes into the edge of the North American craton, which I haven't mentioned yet, but now you can see it here on the screen. 
Look up in Alaska. Do you see where the deformed edge of the craton and the accretionary coastal plain goes up into Alaska? Now look in Canada. Do you see the brownish portion? The brownish portion going over, making up the central part of the craton, the more stable portion. Now the earthquakes go up along the deformed edge of the craton and then follow it down across through Canada, down into the Pacific Northwest United States, following the USGS marked red line plate boundary map here, where the red line is, and following the craton interior over by Alberta and BC, right at their border. And that's exactly the path or the trajectory that the earthquakes take. And now I want you to compare the earthquakes over the last 48 hours coming out of the Northwest United States, going out of Montana, down through Idaho, down through Wyoming and Yellowstone, down into Utah, Southern Colorado, over into Oklahoma and back up the East Coast. This is 48 hours worth of earthquake activity. Compare it to the outside edge of the crater. It's a perfect match where the deformed edge is, the purple versus the brownish tannish color or rusty brown color, orange, whatever. And the spots where we're seeing earthquake activity along the edge of the craton, the interior portion, are weak points, such as drilling points, like oil and gas. Also, volcanic locations, like Yellowstone, for instance. Bunker facilities, deep quarry points, and even points that have power lines at them that could be some kind of electric discharge coming up out of the crust or going down into the crust, leading to earthquake activity in a magnetic resonance VLF. Now this gets into some very interesting stuff. Let's see if I've got it on here. Medium.com electric no ultra low frequency earthquake. Let's see if that brings it up. Here we go. Now somebody sent this to me and it's several years old but it actually is coming from several studies. So for instance, here's the National Institute of Health, <laughs> NIH.gov, but they carry all kinds of other scientific papers, in case you guys don't know. But let's see, is this, here we go. Critical, criticality features in ultra low frequency magnetic fields prior to the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan, the big one, the big nine. What this basically says, based on extensive studies during the last few decades, it is generally accepted nowadays that electromagnetic phenomenon appear prior to an earthquake. Using the amplitude data of VLF, low very low frequency and low frequency transmitter signals propagating in the Earth's ionosphere, waveguide during the seven-year observation, Hay Hayakawa et al. 2010. Okay, you guys can read the rest of this. What it says is that ULF, ultra-low frequencies, are showing up, coming up out of faults and rocks, before a large earthquake. Now, this is the article that was sent to me from 2014. They discover how rocks produce magnetic pulses that are coming up along the edges of the plate and that they are able to almost do some kind of forecasting that they think is possible. This is as of 2014. With the ultra-low frequency, ULF. Now, wait a second. Put on the brakes. Let's go back to the video I just showed you of the waves spreading out through the tank. I showed you the hammering action already. I think that's from very low frequency happening, coming up out of the core of the Earth itself, which is vibrating. A plasma ball vibrating down inside of the core of the Earth, which produces VLF. Did you guys know that large balls of vibrating plasma produce VLF? If it's many miles wide? Here, let me prove that to you. HARP, H-A-A-R-P, VLF, plasma. What they did with HARP, let me get a diagram on here. What they did with HARP was use high frequency. Here, here's an example. This is from the U.S. Army. This example, now you'll see it comes from me. This is my post. I found this. The U.S. Army did experiment. This graphic is from the U.S. Army, by the way. The U.S. Army used HARP, and this is the representation of HARP <laughs> that they provided, but used HARP to project high frequency up into the E region of the ionosphere, 100 kilometers up, where they created a superheated plasma that was visible. This is the night vision of it, green night vision that they used to actually visibly see this in the sky. And they used HARP to project and create a several mile wide area up in the ionosphere that was glowing like the northern lights. And it was vibrating like a bass drum 
creating VLF. And very low frequency was vibrating out from there and going into the Earth's magnetic field, which that VLF was caught up in the Earth's magnetic field and went down to areas off the coast of New Zealand. Harp VLF buoy Stanford. See if we can get images on this. The Harp One Hop buoy. This is from them actually believe well it, look tattooed has it on there okay here we are here here's the graphic provided by them so you guys can go look this up but i just randomly clicking on this one they have harp up here in alaska and they're shooting up into the ionosphere like i just showed you in that other graphic and it's real small here so it's kind of hard to see but shooting up creating the ball of plasma that vibrates and puts off an electromagnetic wave vlf though very low frequency and each wave peak height is like several hundred miles across or more even a few thousand but it was going up and around and coming back down at the conjugate point a magnetic conjugate point is what it's called and it's off the southeast coast of new zealand down here where they went and put a buoy a vl this is a picture of the buoy from tattoos got it on a site this is the picture of the buoy the vlf antenna buoy to pick up the very low frequency that was coming down in the southern hemisphere at the conjugate point, a magnetic point on the opposite side of the planet. Here's another diagram from the professionals themselves. And they even tell you which, well, how many megahertz they used. They did it at three, very low frequency, three megahertz. Well, it's still, actually, that's not VLF, that's high frequency. But anyway, getting into the long and long thick of it, that there's a spread, an equal spread of wave activity going through the crust of the Earth, which I think is then matching up with the edge of the craton, and it's conducting that around the edge of the craton, and it matches. Again, the earthquakes go across the plates like a wave tank, but the wave we're talking about is very low frequency, which is being generated from plasma down in the core of the earth which is rotating and spinning now i'm going to show you something else that's absolutely phenomenal and why i think that the core of the earth is a superheated gaseous plasma and the gas that we're talking about is vaporized iron vaporized nickel vaporized uranium and it's being powered by the sun but let me show you a video from mr fix it rick amazing video this guy deserves a nobel peace prize spinning plasma ball experiment Let's see if this brings it up there it is mr fix it rick seven years ago now this is amazing this is a plasma ball like you'd buy in the store and what mr fix it rick did was he put the plasma ball in a closed chamber so there's no wind interference and it's already in a closed gaseous chamber the plasma ball itself it's got neon gas i think in there and you put an electric current up through the post you guys know how a plasma ball works right an electric current goes up through the post. It then electrifies through the gas, and you put your hand on the outside, and ooh, pretty, the electric, the the electrons are drawn through the gas out to the edge of the, the glass, and you can move around, and it's really pretty, and it's just an electrified gas, right? Okay, well, I think the same thing's going on in the core of the Earth, but instead of neon gas, we have vaporized, compressed vaporized iron and nickel in a gaseous state, maybe even other heavy elements. That's what I think is going on. But what happens when you provide an electric current into that? Now, it comes up through the post. In this case, it comes up through the post and is in this glass container, okay? But look what happens when you rotate it. Now, watch this. So, a plasma ball is normally going. You can see the tendrils on it here just randomly reaching around like an octopus, right? So what Mr. Fix-It Rick does is he rotates the chamber and he rotates it physically. He begins to physically rotate this inside. It starts to rotate as well, which we would expect with force and inertia. But look what happens when you speed it up to several hundred RPM. Do you notice anything about the tendrils? They begin to become organized. And they break off into a North Pole and a South Pole, a magnetic field of its own, which is being projected out. And the centrifugal force of the tendrils moving through this gas, it forms into a, well, a North Pole, a South Pole, and an equator. 
Now, let me take it forward a little bit further into the video, and you'll see this even more. The doorbell's about to ring. We've got a delivery here. Look at the North Pole, how it sorts itself out. So, randomly, the tendrils are just going around, reaching out, finding their random point. But when you apply a hyper-oscillation, what I call a hyper-rotation, which is when you physically rotate it, it then organizes into a North Pole. Path of least resistance in the gas. And look, it even forms perfectly into what we would consider to be like the tropics. And, and then it pulses too with the oscillation. It resets itself as it goes back down to the South Pole and up to the North Pole. It resets to the equator as this is hyper oscillating. It's a term I've had to create to describe what this is. That it's already oscillating. Here, when it's let me explain this this way. When this is going like this, the electrical current itself is quote unquote oscillating. An oscillation is a back and forth, or you could call it a wave or a rotation. It's rotating three dimensionally speaking. And so when you rotate it and it's already rotating, it for some reason organizes into a north and south pole. This is the rotating of a plasma and a neon gas and just applying a small amount of electrical current like five volts. Now I think this is happening down inside the core of the earth that this here is happening inside at a massive level. Now, this ties in with something else. Else, Earth, they have found out that Earth is pulsating 26 seconds. Why does Earth pulse every 26 seconds? They just released this last month, like less than 30 days ago. Earth keeps pulsating every 26 seconds. No one knows why. Why is Earth pulsating every 26 seconds, and why can't scientists explain it after 60 years? This is an enigma wrapped in periodically predictable mystery motion. Could be a harmonic phenomenon, a regular seismic chirp caused by the sun's energy, or a beacon drawing scientists to its source to begin a treasure hunt. In the early 1960s, a geologist named Jack Oliver first documented the pulse, also known as a micro-seism, according to Discover. Oliver, who worked at Columbia University's Lamont Daughtery Geological Observatory at the time, heard the noise but didn't have an advanced instrument seismologist now have it is at their disposal, at his disposal. Since then, scientists have spent a lot of time listening to the pulse and even finding out where it comes from. Quote, a part of the Gulf of Guinea called the Bight of Bonnie, Discover says. Hmm, West Pacific, eh? Gulf of Guinea? I don't know where that is. Some researchers think the pulse is a kind of prosaic cause under the world's oceans, the continental shelf acts as a giant, gigantic wave break. It's the boundary of very far edge off a wave break. Oh, okay. If that sounds improbable, consider all the different shapes of drums being drummed by an ocean, basically, is what they're trying to say. Oh, man. So they go on to say in this long, drawn-out article, which you can go because it sits behind a paywall almost, that they don't have an answer for the pulsating that's being picked up and a low frequency. They don't have the answer for the low frequency pulse that is coming out and heard around the whole planet. Well, I think we have it. Guess what's pulsing at low frequency? Plasmas. And the bigger it is, well, the lower hertz it's going to be, the more low of a frequency, like a giant bass drum like they used with a timpani. But what's bouncing and booming is plasma. So there's a spread of the same sized earthquakes that spread out and away and we have a 4.9 to 5.0 earthquake striking. And one more time, look where Nunavut is on the Craton diagram. It's right up there on the north side. It's pretty obvious. It's right where the edge of the Craton bends off to the north. So it's been displaced. This very low frequency spreading out down across into Alaska and all the way up into Nunavut. Once it gets to the Craton, it's then absorbed by the Craton and the Juan de Fuca fracture zone coming in from the northwest as well. And in the Juan de Fuca fracture zone, over the past several weeks, if not a couple months at this point, the plate has been shifting with hundreds of tremors almost every single day. Now, tremors are not really earthquakes. They're vibrations as the plate shifts. And I need to turn on the last 24 hours worth of earthquakes so we can see all the smaller activities, 0, 0.0 and greater. Here's 24 hours. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Last day, 0, 0.0, one more time. That's better. Okay, so last day, 0, 0.0, you can see it. 
We have no earthquake activity to report to you out of Oregon. Meanwhile, to the north, last night, a line of small earthquakes spreading across Washington, going down across Montana, down into Yellowstone National Park, then spreading south to Sulphur Peak, then going further south, down into Utah, down to our drill points in Carbon County. We're going right past Magna, Utah, at the bunker facilities of all places. It's also a mine location where BP Mine is. But nothing back across Oregon. I just, I'm wondering, what's the tremor situation going on? Let's go see. So the tremors are not earthquakes. They're vibrations as the plate shifts. How many are there? 58 as of yesterday on the 23rd down in southwest Oregon. That's a change from where we were the day before. Look at the 22nd, 179. And we're centered in southwest Oregon and northern California. Go back the day before that, and it was 200, 202. Centered in Washington and southwest Oregon, basically going right up to the California border again. Back to the 20th, another 200. So it was like 200, 200, 180, and then we drop off down to 58. Looks to me like it's slowing down finally. The slow slip is slowing down. It's about time for it to release its full amount that it's built up over the last month and a half. And it should release out in the ocean. Out in the Juan de Fuca fracture zone, which we can see here on the USGS map much easier, where the red line is again. So that red line, just like the rest of the planet here, should have something in the 5.5 or greater range striking out here in the ocean, but we have a problem. They haven't been reporting 5.0 range earthquakes or greater. They, it has to be like 7.0 for them to report it out here. Did you know that? They put a new threshold on reporting earthquakes out here. They don't report fives. They don't report fours unless somebody says something. Somebody, If you say something, then they'll, they'll, they'll get on there and report it or something. But I, I, some kind of directive? Do you guys know about that? Okay. Anyway, 5 point something should be striking out here. 5.5 to be in line with the rest of the plate, just like going over into Asia. Look, I mean, or over into Europe, I mean, it should be the same thing going over into the United States right out here off the coast. Now that the slow slip is slowing down, it could go much bigger. We've seen a 7, 7.5, 7.7 7 earthquake accompany slow slips in the past out here in the ocean on the north side up in the Hecate Strait. But I'm going to look right in the middle, right along the coast out here. Well, not right along the coast, 400 miles off the coast out here at the pinnacle tip of the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. Now, let's go look up these earthquakes in Washington. Washington? Washington. Let's go see. Is it even an earthquake? I guess we got to ask, first of all. You know, we got some shenanigans going on up here with reporting of earthquakes sometimes. What's going on with this one? White Swan, Washington. It's listed as an earthquake. I guess we should put the coordinates in and go see what's there. 0 0.9, small earthquake, little microquake down in Washington. We have a shift going on nearby with the plate shifting over the past week. Ah, oh, wait, there's the Autonom. Autonom, the town of Autonom. The Autonom Ridge structure is right here. It's well known. These ridges go over to the west, and we might even be able to see the Autonom Ridge structures here on the USGS fault zone map. Hold on. Let's see if they got them. Yeah, there we go. Right there, going south of Yakima. Yak Yakima. Yakima. <laughs> Don't even try. Don't even try. Don't even try to correct me. Don't write it in comment. I'm not listening. Let's go on. Come over here to Missouri, and we'll teach you how to say Missouri proper. <laughs> Washington again. Let's go in and take a look. Another small earthquake, but at least it's not an explosion. You know, we had a problem with a lot of explosions out here. Bubba was out there. Bubba, his brother Daryl, and his other brother Daryl. We're all out there with Tannerite doing some target practice. But then people told me it wasn't Bubba. It was hippies. They, they we're talking about Washington here. It was hippies out there, and they blew something up. Blew something up, man. Birkenstock Central. Okay, here we are. No, this is Mount Rainier. I don't think they have any coffee shops here either. Come on, how many more Northwest jokes can I crack? All right, guys. Mount Rainier, we're on the Northwest side or the Northwest flank of Mount Rainier. We are east and southeast of downtown Seattle. So I would think we're closer, of course, to Mount Rainier to, than the Seattle Fault. Up here, we have the Seattle Fault that goes across Seattle, but it's much closer to the volcano. As a matter of fact, we were down below the crater two weeks ago. We were right down here below the crater and on both sides of the actual flanks of the volcano. Now we've spread out around it. 
It's kind of like the circus tent top analogy where the center gets pushed up first, then within a short period of time, a week, two weeks, we start to see movement around the outside edge as the edge perimeters begin to rise as well. What about the 0.4? Let's go check this one out. This is getting much closer to the Seattle Fault. Let's go see how close we are. It's named the Seattle Fault. It goes through Seattle. Yeah, it's right there, just to the north. Joint base Lewis McCord is right on the foot of this, though. Hold on. Oh, man, I don't even want to get into that. Okay, we're just going to move on from the military stuff. I'm not covering military today. I'm not covering hot spots today. We're leaving all that controversial stuff alone. Let's go up to the north. I Oh, wait. Ugh. Come on, everybody. Say it with me. Boom. One, two, three. Boom. Got an explosion. Let's go see what's here. Probably a quarry. We, gotta, we have to look it up. Sometimes there's no quarry there. And it's just an explosion out in the middle of nowhere. Which then leads to maybe being a, some kind of other cause. But look, here we have two quarries. We have one on either side and a house in between. The earthquake is detected at the house in between. But I'm thinking it probably is related to one of the blasts at one of these quarries on either side. Or maybe both. It is a middle point between both quarries. Maybe there's a man-made fault or something there. Now, I think this is a quarry blast as well. Let's go see. Another explosion. But this one's at a Canadian quarry. I know that. Wow. So half of them are explosions. Half of them are earthquakes. Nothing across Oregon. Well, Oregon shifting. Over to the east, we're above the magma chamber for Yellowstone still. But the number of earthquakes has dropped off over in Idaho. And the magma chamber for Yellowstone goes below central Idaho all the way over into Oregon. Down 30 kilometers 11 Grand Canyons in size. And above it, that's where our twos and our ones are taking place in Stanley, Idaho. Like I said, Sulphur Peak was struck down here to the east-southeast point of Idaho. And then we have a line of earthquakes that goes across the Craton Edge. Goes right down through Montana, down into the park at Yellowstone. And that's actually where the greatest number of earthquakes has struck so far over here. Inside the park, right east of Lake Yellowstone, now up at the surface. Meanwhile, the bunker facilities down to the south. Do I need to show these all to you? Do I need to show you Sulphur Peak and the bunkers and uh, the oil pumping operations in Utah? Let me let me just show you each spot. Hold on. Again, it's better to see it than to, for me to describe it. So we'll start here. Sulphur Peak. Oh, we also have some hot spots that are right around here. But Sulphur Peak is right there. There's Sulphur Peak. And next to Sulphur Peak, we have the Blackfoot Lava Field. Conda Buttes, China Butte, Cinder Island, etc. These are all small old volcanoes. Now you'd think that that's tied to Yellowstone, which it is. Overall, it is. The magma chamber that feeds these smaller volcanoes also feeds Yellowstone. Clearly, it's a weak point in the crust. But that's just where we start. We start right there. Then we go down through Salt Lake City. And right in here, let me see if I can find it by sight alone. Where is it? Right there, Magna, Utah. Earthquake striking right across the tailing ponds, which are next to the bunker facilities and the mining facilities for BP Mining, which are on these conveyor belts that come up and move along the ore or whatever they're extracting out of there. Okay, so there. And then we go down to the oil pumping operations at Carbon County at the north tip of this valley here that comes up and goes back down to the south and you see that bend that it makes there and the two earthquakes are striking at the north tip of the bend of the valley well go pull the coordinates if you need to i already have the area memorized getting down here into utah right through the tip of this valley price in carbon county here see it says carbon county now if you zoom in close you'll see all these little pads in the ground here and every little pad is a different oil or gas well mainly oil i think across here so, I mean, they might be doing fracking and gas extraction, but every little pad is a different jack, pump, pipeline, well. Here, you can even see the shadow of the jack of the pump right there. Now, it goes through the mountains on this side of the mountain. I don't know if you'll see it as well, but let me zoom in. You go through the mountains, and once you get over to here, it gets into the thousands of drill points where every one of these little pads is a different oil well in the mountain range. And they just keep going and going and going down into the valley where it looks like a grid on the ground. And every one of these is an oil well as well. Okay, so you get the picture. It's a lot of drilling, and that's where our earthquakes go down to, the 1.0 and 
Over to the west, this lone 1.5, I have to go look up. I do not know what's over at, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Skiopio? Skip, Skipio. I have no clue how to say it. Not going to even attempt to try to say it again. Search. I could go look it up. People ask me, why don't I go look it up? Because half the update would be me looking up histories on names of things. Okay, where are we? Uh, oh, ha, huh. well, hey, it pays to look. We're on the east side of a large volcanic field right here, the Black Rock Desert. That's a lava flow. And there's the Smithsonian place marks on it. That's the younger lava flow. The older is right here, which itself is an old butte. Up to the north, you see there's even more lava flows coming off of Pavant Butte. And we're right next to it. As a matter of fact, the earthquake's right on the other side of the ridge. Now, there could be other features here. Is this some kind of explosion or anything that we need to know about? No, it's not. 3.8 kilometer depth down into the crust next to the volcanic field. So what do all these locations have in common? Trill points and volcanoes. So far, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious. They're puncture points in the plate. Mother Nature is punched up from down below or humans have drilled in from up above. And in the bunker case or the quarry case, well, those are pretty straightforward as well. They're puncture points in the plate. Which then is sought out as this inundating force saturates the plate. The equal spacing of the same sized quake starts to take place across. And imagine it this way. We put a lid on this tank, bring it right down to the water level, and we start pumping energy into the water. But we have a concrete or stone layer lid on the top, and this is hammering through cracks in the plate but it's not liquid doing it it's very low frequency a vibration of sorts and it goes across the edge of the craton seeking out the drill points and the volcanoes and everywhere along the way with the same sized earthquakes then we get to a stick point a point where there's been 500,000 drill points across that mass and that's into oklahoma at the kansas border where this cluster of earthquakes is taking place at another series of oil and gas drill points and I'll go pull the coordinates in the middle of here. And then you can go look out on either side of Ames, Oklahoma to see how many thousands of drill points are here on the edge of the plate in the Craton. Search. Look. See for yourself. So here's the earthquake epicenter. And right next to the earthquake epicenter, we'll zoom in, and you'll see little gray scraped out pads on both sides of the road. One side of the road, there's nothing in the pad. You see there's like a little thing that's been driven around a few times. That's like the cap-off point. Now across the road, we have the jack, the tanks, the burn apparatus, and a protective berm around the tanks in case they leak or explode. And it looks like they did wastewater disposal on this side of the road. And this side of the road, they're creating pressure and whatever else injecting. Same with over to the east. I might be wrong on that. It might be flip-flopped. But you see how many there are. And every little pad is a different drill point for oil or gas. Ah, and for every one or two, pardon me, I had to cough there. For every one or two that I had marked here, there's a hundred more or more that are not marked. There's 500,000 different drill points across Oklahoma on the edge of the Craton. And that's where the earthquakes are striking. Now, over to the east, we get into the middle of the New Madrid Seismic Zone. And we are at a place called Tiptonville, Tennessee, but right across the river. Well, here, let me, let me show you a picture speaks a thousand words. The New Madrid Seismic Zone. Some people say New Madrid, like Madrid, Spain. No, it's Mad Rid. And here we are. There's the town of New Madrid, Missouri. And it's the most famous seismic zone in the United States, at least the one that we learn about in school and everybody tells us about the great 1800s earthquakes that made the Mississippi River flow backwards. Now, the N-shaped bend, it's like a capital or lowercase n shape bend to remember New Madrid, the letter N. And the Mississippi River Valley goes down to the south. 
Now look at all our little red dots. Do you see these red dots? Every one of these red dots is a hot spot that has been detected currently taking place right now. And we have a few clusters of hot spots. For instance, here. What is the name of this location? Texarkana, right at the Texas-Arkansas border region. A big cluster. Also, massive outbreak of hot spots across the southern states. Southern Mississippi, southern Alabama, southern Georgia, northern Florida. But then it kind of puddles out over down into southeast Florida, down around Lake Ocala. And I'm probably butchering the way that's pronounced. We need to go look it up. I said I wasn't going to cover it, but apparently I'm wrong about what I said. Let's go. Oh, wait. We have rain and clouds over most of the areas. Wonderful. Well, if it's raining, it shouldn't be hot spots. Let's go see. Electrical, guys. Electrical. I want you to think electrical now. These hot spots are electrical lines. Every, most every one of them. And they go on and off for five minutes at a point. They flare on. Some stay on for an hour or two. Electrical arcing across the deformed edge of the craton. The deformed edge of the craton is, for some reason, interacting with the power lines. And it goes all the way out to the west coast. And it shows up before earthquake activity. That would mean we would need to watch the southern states for new seismic activity to take place. I would just look right in the middle of the whole hot mess. What is that, Alabama? Alabama, Georgia? I wouldn't rule out Mississippi, though. I mean, look, we have to look in the middle of all these electrical discharges. Now, remember what I told you about the VLF, very low frequency, because that matters. Let's go pull up very, or, well, VLF electric. The basics of VLF. So, very low frequency is 3 to 30,000 hertz. Why does that matter? Well, we get into this, how, what is common electrical hertz. Let's go look that up. Common USA electrical hertz. 50 hertz. But you can change your voltage to 220, 110 volts, 60 hertz. American frequency, 60 hertz. Cycles per second, 60 hertz. Now, wait a second. That's very low frequency, isn't it? Or is it ultra low frequency? Ultra low frequency it is. So if it's ultra low frequency, and we're getting electrical arcing happening across the edge of the craton, and we know that the plate releases ultra low frequency in electromagnetic waves, as per the studies I showed you just 30 minutes ago, and it's seeking out almost like equally spaced across the power lines, across a vast distance that's being charged with some kind of very low frequency electromagnetics, which is then causing an arc and showing up as a hotspot. Now, I would like to just quickly zoom in on these hotspots and go see if there's anything around here in Texarkana. We should have some high voltage power lines, most likely at these locations, unless they're flaring off oil wells of some kind, which is also possible, but... Oh, the other thing, train, train tracks. That's the other... The train tracks. Uh, there, there's our old train tracks again. Wait, are these power lines too? Or are they strictly old train tracks? Two sets of old train tracks. Wow, okay. Our electrical power lines are right here. The big high voltage guy. And a pipeline. All right, well, that's enough right there. A pipeline, electrical voltage, and the trains all right next to each other. Same with this. Look at these. We have the high voltage power lines going right through the center of the area where all the hot spots are. And they're the big clear cut kind, so it's not like it's just some small power line going to your house. And it's such a cluster of them. We know it, we've seen this happen now over and over again. We can just randomly zoom in on these. Let's do that. Let's just go randomly zoom in and see how close we are. We're usually within a mile or two of the, yeah, yeah, look, look. Look at this huge set of high voltage power lines and pipeline. You see them. They're clear-cut across the area. And you can see the shadow of some of the towers, depending on which angle the photo is taken at. Or hopefully you can see these. Hold on, let me make sure you can see it all. So that's just a random zoom-in on one of them here. Let's go up here to this next one. 
hey, look, it's the same power set of power lines, guys. It's going from one county to the next. And right next to it, we've got ourselves another short out, if you will. Now, we, it looks like we also have something over here, but I don't know what. It looks like some kind of clear cut was done in the past. Maybe for mining. That might be old clear cut and replant for mining. What about up here? I'm just looking. I've got to see. So two sets of hotspots. One from yesterday, one from today. Two days in a row. Maybe this is some kind of control burn. Maybe they've got it going, burning for a couple days, and they're just doing a control burn. Do we have anything here nearby that's going across? The oh, well. Another set of high voltage power lines right there, guys. You just saw it. And maybe you didn't. Is there anything else? I don't see anything else here nearby. That's enough for me. I mean, we could keep going, but I've already done this with almost all of them. They go all back, most of these, not all, but most of these go back directly to power lines or right next to them within a mile of the high voltage kind, not the kind that just go to your house. And it's not like there's high voltage everywhere. What are all these? What is, what is all this? Okay, ponds of some kind out here. Uh, it looks like some kind of housing, maybe? No. Yeah, housing of some kind. What do we have going through here? Road. Right, so I'm curious. I My curiosity is peaked on these with the hotspots showing up next to the power lines. But on this one, I, I don't see any. Do you guys see any? Maybe I'm missing it. Look at the roads, though. It's going to be kind of hard to tell. Those aren't showing. Those aren't. So, are they all at them? I don't think so. I just looked at some right there, and they aren't. So, what's causing it? Here's some that are. Here's some that are directly next to the power lines again. Tattooed, my buddy down in Florida here, he's been having some show up over here down in South Jacksonville, and he went to the locations, and they were power lines. He physically drove there. Like, one was 8 miles from his house or 12 miles from Middleburg, and he drove there. And they were right at the high voltage power lines. I guess it was maybe one of these sets right here. So something's going on with the power lines because, well, we know. I mean, you, now, again, there's farmers that are going to burn and there's going to be uh, oil wells that put off flares. We go out here into New Mexico, for instance. What's out here in the middle of the desert? Now we're out here in the desert. Another hot spot. But what's there? We've got a, a ranch. We've got desert sands sparse vegetation we're right at the county line is there anything going right by the area i mean what could be leading to the hot spot in the middle of the desert these are questions that we need to answer and i don't know how we will oh wait what's this an oil and gas pumping operation right next to it okay i'm glad i looked wells they can flare off oil wells in many locations are there oil hey, look is there oil in here let's see no looks like there was something here at some point in the past oh no there is look tank jack pump pipeline burn apparatus for safety purposes how many of them are there that's not one there's another one okay all right so We've got an oil pumping operation or gas right there. And we've got an oil or gas pumping operation right next to it there. Two flare-off points where the wells can flare off if there's overpressure going on. But man, that would mean something's going on out there, wouldn't it? What about down here? What's this? Out in the middle of a desert-like location. We do have a little ranch there of some kind. Maybe they're burning some. Maybe, maybe this would be a case of a farmer burning their field. Finally, we've got one. Like the only farmer to ever burn their field actually gets finally caught on one of these. Quarrying, but just surface quarrying. That could even be mining or prospecting of some kind. I have to look into every location now. And this could take hours. It really could. Oh, oh of course we're at Roswell. Oh, oh my God. Of course. Now look at the fault. You can see the fault. It goes through the mountains, goes through the desert, carries on through the mountains, carries on through the desert, goes up to the north and dead ends right up here. So there is a fault there. I wouldn't be surprised if there's maybe some kind of heat release, but eh, we've got a we've got some kind of ranch out there. 
unless I find some kind of pumping operation right next to the ranch, I'm going to think that it's them burning something. And I don't find any pumping operation there nearby. Okay, carrying on. One that is not answerable. Up to the north, we can keep going, but I think you start to get the picture. The hot spots, for the most part, are showing up next to the power lines. Sometimes next to drill points, and a few rare of the rare locations are out in the middle of nowhere with nothing at the location, which then leads to maybe thinking that it's some kind of actual fire going on or control burn, etc. Over on the west coast, we have some taking place right now in Northern California, across up into the mountains of Northern California. Let's go see what's going on here. Two hot spots right now, Northern California, next to this lake, whatever this place is called. What uh, we got a dam here. What is the name of this place? Let's turn on our Google Earth community. Let's turn on the place names. I can't believe I don't have a lake name coming up on this massive body of water. Ah, it's a big old lake out in California somewhere. Ridgeville Islands are in the middle of there. On the east side, though, that's what I'm curious about, these hot spots that are showing up. Do we have fires going on out in California? Do they have temperatures assigned to this? Let's see. No temperature assigned to this yet. Good fire pixel being detected. Well, at this point, let's go look at California then. Let's jump all the way out. We're looking going from the south, United States, over to the west coast, California. Oh yeah, look at that. Well, yeah, you can see these. These are black splotches. So some kind of fire going on up here. Northwest tip of the valley. Northwest tip of the valley, same spot. Northwest of Redding, right next to where the shifting was taking place. Spotted Owl territory. That just came up, okay. So a hot spot out there on the west coast means that there's something going on up in Northern California. And look where our earthquake is. Hey, look, last night going into this morning, Bernie, oh, wow, Bernie, California. How ironic, and not in a funny way. Oh, boy, okay, let's paste and search. Let's go see how close the earthquake is to the hot spots. Okay, the earthquake is coming in in the middle of our volcanic segment here, which is actually huge. All of these are lava flows. Do you see them? They're not, these aren't forest fire burn locations. These are lava flows. And look how many there are. We're right next to Freener Peak, Hall Butte, Wilcox Peak, Sugarloaf Peak, southeast of Red Rock Hill Butte Volcano. And the Smithsonian marked is the, are the Twin Buttes. A group of cinder cones there. But I mean, come on. It goes back up to Cinder Butte with all of its, there's like five or six cinder cones on top of Cinder Butte. And that's the lava flow that comes off of Cinder Butte that goes all the way down to here. Amazing stuff. That's where the earthquake is. Over to the east, a 1.8 into Nevada, Black Rock City, Nevada, 11 kilometer depth. Now, we're not normally over here at Black Rock City, but there is something here nearby in Black Rock City. We're going to get into a back to back series of earthquakes that are all right next to something interesting. So, for instance, we're here at Salt Flats, and look what we have in the middle of these salt flats. Looks to me like we have some kind of Burning Man Festival of some kind, where a bunch of rich, weird people go out there and do some kind of Burning Man thing. Bra, bra, Burning Man. Okay, well, okay, we're, we're at the Gerlach Empire. We're at an edge of a volcanic field, and this is Fly Geyser. It's actually, this is a spot where a long time ago, they drilled in to go get water, and they didn't know it was some kind of geothermal whatever, and it came out and started to form its own large mineral structure. Now it's a very tall... Let me see if I got pictures on here. Here. There it is. The mineral deposits have piled up that much and it's become discolored, but that's man-made. They, again, they drilled into this thing and under high pressure it came out and now the minerals in the water have built up over time into basically like a giant stalagmite. You guys know stalagmites, they pile up on the floor of a cave when it's dripping in from above. Well, this is actually shooting out and falling back down on the ground. 
So it is technically falling from above, forming that. As it shoots up, then it comes back down, of course. Okay, so now we get out of Fly Geyser and Burning Man Festival, and we go down here to Steamboat Springs, which is on the northeast side of Lake Tahoe at Reno or South Reno. Steamboat Springs. And it's a geothermal field as well, and Smithsonian Marked Volcano. Let me show you. Damn hippies up there. Damn hippies up at the Burning Man Festival. Ah, you're the bane of existence. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They're not real hippies, guys. They're yuppie hippies. You know, the rich kind. All right. Here we are. Northeast Lake Tahoe. No offense to my... Oh, God. Oh, no. No offense to my rich yuppie viewers. All right. Here we are. Carson City, Steamboat Springs. Hey, it's the thought that counts, isn't it? Now, carrying on down to the south, we're at this place. This is Geysers, California. The name speaks for itself. It's where they're generating electricity. Using geothermal, humans have drilled into this volcanic field, Clear Lake Volcanic Field, on the side of it, to get steam. There's Geysers, Geyserville. Here are our geothermal turbines. Now, the pipelines that go to drill points, and the drill points go down a few hundred to a few thousand feet into the volcanic field to get the steam, or to get the heat at least. They pump sewage down into the ground there, but that's enough. We're not going to even talk about that. I'm talking sewage from your house, the nasties. Now let's go down to Oakland. We're going into Oakland, Bay Area. Speaking of hippies, speaking of hippies, we're going into the Bay Area. Let's go see what's going on. I see a guy on a long board and a turd on the ground. Ah, beautiful California. Here. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. It's a joke. It's a joke. Okay, now let's carry on. Here's the earthquake epicenter. And actually, this is absolutely nice little area here. I, you know what? Let's see if we got a street level. Become famous in a Dutch Sense video. There we are. Look at that. That's quaint. That's nice. It's beautiful. Oh, look, they drive Benzes. How many Mercedes are you going to put in one spot? I'm telling you, man. All right. There we are. Look where all those power lines come together. All right. Anyway, we are on the edge of the Hayward Fault. And we can see the Hayward Fault on the USGS Fault Zone map just a little bit better. We'll click on the earthquake. And we'll click on a street level view, tectonic plates, U.S. Fault, so we can see how they all overlap. There's the Hayward. And it goes down and meets back up with the San Andreas. But the energy that feeds the Hayward here, really, is coming from up here at the volcano. Which itself is traced back up to the northwest. Up to the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. Which is still technically shifting down in southwest Oregon. Northern California shifting down here. And it's been hundreds of tremors in the past several days. 200 the day before that. 200 the day before that. And now we're down in the 60 range. So it should release with a new five out in the ocean, followed by fours going back down across the plate, creeping section of the San Andreas, Monterey Bay, south of the Bay Area, new 4.0 range coming in. Same with over here at the California-Nevada border, 4.0 range coming in. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it for the forecast for now. So we should see a new four on the west coast, along the coast, on the San Andreas. A new four over at the Super Volcano, right here and there is a super volcano right at the california nevada border in addition to a series of other volcanoes getting hit over into nevada at the monte cristo hills ridgecrest well look at this you went back up and how high did you go you went back up into the 2.0 range i think it was right at two but it's not that much of an increase the number of earthquakes has leveled off the diagonal line going from Kozo Volcanic Field. Let me pull the northernmost earthquake here again. Nothing has changed location-wise. But power-wise, you're due for another push to come down. But first, I think it's going to strike at the California-Nevada border and be deflected. But that still means you'll increase. It just should be under 4.0. Maybe 3.5. I hope I got this right. Here's where we start. This diagonal line of quakes here, 
starts right here. At Kozo Volcanic Field, you see the rising domes, magma protruding in down below, causing those to rise up. But you'll also see these. Devil's Kitchen Geothermal Pumping Operation. Geothermal turbines, pipelines, drill points, injection water points where they inject water and get steam. Comes back out of the... to turn the turbines. So that's where we start. Then the line of earthquakes goes on the east side of all these lava flows. That's Volcano Peak and its 14 other eruptive points across China Lake. And then it goes down. The line of earthquakes goes down here and dead ends into something called the Garlock Fault. The Garlock Fault starts down to the southwest, goes up to the east-northeast. And show it to you on the USGS map once again. Here is the Garlock Fault. So energy comes down, and it hits the Garlock Fault. It's like a wall, if you will. But it spreads. It spreads to the east, over to the edge of the crater. And it tries to spread down across the fracture zones, or faults, that go across the Mojave Desert. And out in the middle of the Mojave, look what we have. Small earthquake activity coming across, going past the volcanoes in the middle of the Mojave. Ludlow, California. This is Lavic Lake. Pisgah Crater, where my viewers might remember the story behind Pisgah. I'm not going to tell it again. But look how close to Pisgah we're coming. It's right across the highway. There's Pisgah Crater and its lava flow and its steam location from a couple years ago. Well, 10 years ago. <laughs> and then here, high tension power lines, high voltage, transmission lines, whole sets of them, three different sets of three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, nine high voltage power lines across the desert. And that's where our earthquake is, right next to them. Following the power lines down to the south. Then going into the LA Basin, we're in South LA. Let's go look this one up. I think I know this location right here. San Clemente? I, I sure do. I know this. I've been here before. I've been to Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, Ah, uh, Huntington Beach, Balboa. It's the only spot I know, okay? Went there a long time ago. But let's go pull the coordinates and go see what's there. It's right along the coast. I think we have marked faults here. USGS should have the faults marked here. Oh, they don't. Oh, man, they don't have any marked faults there. Now, that's just not accurate, but let's go put the coordinates in. We know there are faults going through this location in Southern California. We should be able to see them even, maybe. No? Well, you can see, okay, you can see the foothills. You can see the foothills that connect over to the east and then make greater connections in. That's where our faults are. So they certainly are here, but we're at a highway intersection. Looks to me like we've got a golf course here of some kind. No, a ball diamond. Ball diamond golf course rec center. Really nice. Hoity toity. Now, where are we? Do we have anything else of any significance nearby? Well, aside from the faults, we have a quarry or a landfill, and the quarrying and landfilling can create its own faulting. So I don't see anything else here. We don't have any drill points. We don't have any large power lines unless they're buried. If the power lines are buried, then we're just operating on visual here. Looks to me also like old landfill exists across here, which old landfill can contain methane. San Clemente, isn't there something else here just to the south? I think down here to the south, we have a nuclear power plant, but I'm pretty sure that's pretty far away. An old nuclear power plant. All right, well, I'm glad I went and looked it up. Let's go over to the east and just pull the earthquakes from in the center of this whole hot mess. Anza, California. Well, this takes us in back into Anza Gap. The slow slip location. Professionals told us over five years ago that this whole area from up here at Rancho Cucamonga all the way down to the Mexico border with California has been quote-unquote slow slipping. Tremoring. And it will break and release with an extremely large earthquake on one of the nearby faults, according to professionals, University of Southern California, five years ago. 
tremors going across this. And it hasn't stopped. It's carried on doing this almost every single day. I think there's only been a couple of days out of the last five years where it hasn't shifted in the diagonal line going across from the LA Basin down to the Mexico border. It keeps shifting. Meanwhile, we go quiet for days on end across the creeping section of the San Andreas where it builds and releases in bigger activity. Now, wait a second. Slow slipping, tremoring Southern California along this line? Well, wait a second. Doesn't that match up with the tremors that are going on up in the Northwest? Hold on. Let's go back to the tremor map, if I can find it here. Go back to the tremor map up in the Northwest where these little red dots are happening. Those two are tremors, and those two have magnitudes, zero and one magnitude assigned to them. But they're not really earthquakes, are they? They're vibrating as the plate is shifting, as the Juan de Fuca is charging and pushing in. So if it's happening up here with tremors, and professionals told us it's happening down here with tremors, then all these zeros, ones, and twos down here are pretty much just like the little red dots that I showed you up here. And they should be on the same map. And if you saw them, you would see a line of connecting red dots that goes down along the coast and pools up down here in Southern California. And all of California, Oregon, Washington, and Vancouver Island are shifting still and continue to shift every single day. They don't ever really stop, do they? It picks up into what we call a slow slip ETS, episodic tremor slip, but they carry on day after day bouncing around between these points on the West Coast, all the way down to Southern California. And the more it shifts, guess what? The more seismic that comes in with that. So more earthquake activity comes in with that. And then it spreads out, equally spaced, across the craton edge, trying to equalize. So if we get a big push that comes in, guess what? It's like dropping a rock in a pond. You get your five out here, then you see fours go across the plate, going over to the Midwest, then you maybe take a step down to threes, and you might even reaccumulate on the other side of the tank with another four. And it follows the craton across the plate. It's amazing. So let's recap. Whole thing. We have deep earth. Guys, this is what I want you to take away from this if you have been just like kind of zoning out for the last hour and a half. The deep earthquakes. The deep earthquakes that are taking place now that are spreading out across the plate, that's a sign that we're getting ready to go through something significant when you see multiple deep earthquakes take place from South America. Let me get them on the feed here again. Going from South America, raised high off the globe, over to Fiji, and then down below the West Pacific. How much energy do you think it would take to displace everything from Indonesia, past Fiji, and to South America in a day, all on a 4.0 basis, across 8,000 miles of the planet. Some kind of big force pushing in down below the center of the underside of the West Pacific is displacing everything from South America all the way over to Indonesia, and that middle point should break. And that takes us into Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, right here. Okay? Now, you could say we would watch South America too, which we will, but I'm looking for the big break to take place in between our current sets of most earthquakes in the West Pacific. Europe, you're watching down by Crete. West Coast, you're watching off the coast of Oregon. Is there anywhere else I need to issue a warning for? Oh yeah, Puerto Rico, you're watching along the west coast of Puerto Rico. South America, you're watching here at North Peru for 5.4. You're watching down in Chile for 5.9. Uh, let's see, Taiwan going into South Japan, you're watching for 5.0 to 5.5. And up in Alaska, you're watching for 5.5. So it's going to be pretty busy. If there's anybody I'm leaving... Oh, uh, Afghanistan. I'm leaving out Afghanistan. 5.5 range act activity doing Afghanistan in the next few days as well. So it should be pretty busy. And if I'm wrong, I'll come back on at a moment's notice and correct myself. If it looks like it's dying out or new deep earthquakes increase the activity, well, we'll talk about that too. Finally... We're finally here. We're at the end, everyone. Oh my God, it's finally over. The trolls are like, oh dude, they're like wiping their brows. Okay. We have some good news. YouTube fixed the closed captioning problem on my most recent video. I don't know what's going on. 
I always think the worst. That's a fault of mine to always assume the worst. You know, I've said it before and I should apply it to my own life that if you assume things, it usually makes an ass between you and me or me and you. And when I assume that YouTube is picking on my channel, it might just be a technical glitch. It could be. So I've updated my description to reflect that. The CC problem has now been fixed by YouTube. I always assume the worst, and I'll try not to do that in the future. Bad habit on my part with that assuming the worst thing I've got going on. And I'll tell you guys, don't assume the worst. Stop it. Stop it. You know what? Hey, take a look at the screen. This should make you feel better. Tis the season. Get out your marshmallows. Wait, you don't, you don't roast marshmallows on your home fire, by the way, guys. That, that's not the way you do it. City slickers, don't be roasting marshmallows on your home fire. So we're doing good. I hope you're doing better than I am. And if anything seismically speaking takes place, we will jump back on at a moment's notice to do an update. Now, I do see something here. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. 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 Hold on. When did this hit? No way. 20 minutes ago at 2124 UTC. It's now 2147 UTC. Crete just got hit directly at the spot where I told you to watch at the beginning of this update. Look. Here, let's get the info. Hold on. Yep. Look at that. Okay, so a 4.0 earthquake has struck right at the warned area where I issued the warning at the start of this update, and I was looking for 5-ish range. Ah, damn. Okay, well, that's that's at that one magnitude level under. I, I We might have to still look here. Hold on. We now have to divide the area in half. Now that the area at Crete has been hit, we have to look to our middle point between our middle points. In other words, this middle point has just been filled in with a new quake, like expected, but it's a magnitude under. So now we have to look at the middle points between the middle points. It's cut the area in half, which then bisects it into two points, which means Western Greece and Eastern Greece, or in between Crete and Cyprus, and in between Crete and South Italy, are both going to get hit now. And it may even still go up into the five range, but at least fours are going to be striking at those middle points now that the middle point has been filled in. So it just basically cuts it in half into quarters. And now the quarter points are going to get hit. Amazing, man. Amazing. Dude. Who said that earthquakes... I mean, we, there's proof that earthquakes can be forecast down to a location spot on and within a magnitude or so. Which is great, considering everybody said... It was impossible to know at all a location that was going to hit, get hit by any magnitude, let alone down within a magnitude of what you're looking for. All right, I'm glad that just... Sometimes new people need to see that most of all, or professionals need to see that to understand how outdated the old ideas about random earthquakes. That's outdated. That, that's not accurate. Earthquakes are not random. They're following a trajectory, the plate boundaries. They're related to each other magnitude-wise. And I think there's even a reason for it. Again, even a reason for it. The spreading standing wave that's spreading through the tank. VLF. The cause for it. Anyway, we're done. Saving it as a video. I'll be back later on. Peace out.